As far as racing goes, few leagues are quite as well known as F1. Sporting some of the most high-speed races in the industry, F1 cars have to be super high-tech to compete. And this has led to some drivers making some incredible upgrades to their cars in order to come out on top. Here are the top 15 most incredible F1 innovations. Number 15. Burning Oil While burning oil is something that's very bad in regular cars, it can actually help F1 cars go faster under controlled conditions. In essence, burning oil, which occurs when oil is introduced into a gas-powered engine's combustion chamber, which helps generate more power at the expense of, well, oil. As of now, cars are permitted to burn 1.2 liters of the stuff for every 100 kilometers, which allows them to go faster than they otherwise would without it. However, due to growing concerns around the monitoring of oil burn, many are petitioning for this innovation to be banned in the near future. Number 14. Shark Fins while shark fins on cars may seem a little strange, they can actually make a massive difference on the racetrack. For example, they are rectangular-shaped inserts that go across the back end of a car, and according to physicists, they have a number of cool benefits. The main one is that they build pressure along the outside edge, maximizing inward forces as the car turns around a corner, and ultimately allowing it to do so more efficiently and with more stability. It also improves the rear wing's efficiency and capability, as the fin creates a vortex from the cockpit that channels air directly to the wing. So we think it's fair to say that shark fins are a useful addition to any car. Number 13. Continuously Variable Transmission In most cars, continuously variable transmission, or CVT, is a buzzkill. After all, CVTs use belts instead of gears, and while this improves fuel economy and provides smoother acceleration, this often comes at the expense of acceleration, time, and speed. Yet in 1993, a car company Williams tried to make this their secret weapon by fitting a prototype CVT to its FW15C. Along with a few other new features, the CVT actually ended up helping the car win that year's championship, as it eliminated gear changes and made it easier to keep the engine in its power band. However, after some 1994 regulations forced transmissions to have a certain number of fixed gear ratios, the CVT was effectively put out of service. Number 12. The Lotus 88's Twin Chassis While most race cars try to be lightweight, Lotus put on some pounds in 1981 with the Lotus 88. That's because they opted to put two chassis instead of one in their design, with this being done in an attempt to harness ground effect. Interestingly enough, the outer chassis could move independently of the inner chassis, and the idea was that the aerodynamic forces would push the outer chassis down onto the track, creating that all-important seal. Or the Lotus 88 never raced, as protests from other teams got it banned almost immediately, with a wholesale ban on ground-effect cars later being implemented in 1983 to kill the idea for good. Nonetheless, we think it would have been cool to see a double chassis car in action. Number 11. The Hans. Nothing is worse than an accident on the track, and for many years, one such event could easily lead to the death of a driver. However, in 2003, F1 made steps to stop this by introducing the Hans. It's essentially a U-shaped shoulder collar that's made up of carbon fiber and attached to the helmet by two elastic straps. And it helps prevent serious skull and spinal injuries in the event of a crash, with basal or skull fractures being the number one injury that it could prevent. At first, there were many drivers that were hesitant to wear it, but now it's mandatory in nearly every car racing league. So we think it's fair to say that the Hans is one of a driver's most important tools, as it's one of the few that is a literal lifesaver. Number 10. Portholes When the short-lived era of six-wheel cars came about in the late 1970s, racers faced a pretty large problem when it came to checking their tires. After all, all standard-sized F1 tires were large enough for a racer to seat comfortably while driving. The tiny 10-inch wheels of the six-tire versions were so small that this was simply impossible. In order to overcome this, F1 engineers took lessons from maritime vessels such as boats by adding portholes to the sides of their cockpits. Now, these were designed to not only allow drivers to see the front rubber, but also allow them to, in theory, aim their cars more accurately through the corners. However, in reality, the portholes often became so caked in dirt that they were unusable, therefore nullifying their benefit. 
Yet that doesn't mean that they were totally useless, as they were reportedly a vital addition to Anderstorp in 1976, and it was only due to these windows that driver Jody Schechter realized that what he thought was a tire puncture was actually a missing wheel. So we think it's fair to say that this innovation was pretty useful. Number 9. F-Duct after double diffusers were banned in 2010, teams went on the hunt to find the next competitive advantage, and McLaren soon found it with their proprietary F-duct. In essence, this was a small vent in the cockpit that drivers would block with their legs, which would then redirect airflow so that the air going over the rear flap would be disrupted, which would then induce a stall and speed up the car on straights. This was ingenious at the time. F1 had banned movable aerodynamic devices, so because it was the driver's leg that was the device, it physically could not be banned. Best of all, because this vent was built into the frame of the car, it was near impossible for other teams to copy it, as they would have to replace the entire frame in order to aid in this feature. As a result, McLaren's MP4 25 was a dominant car that year, and after F1 caught on, they opted to ban F-Ducks in 2011. However, to make up for it, F1 introduced the hydraulically activated drag reduction system, which essentially achieved the same thing, albeit with different mechanics. Thus, while the F-duct is now gone for good, today's F1 cars are still able to make use of some similar technology. We are constantly adding more people to the Top 5's production team to bring you all the best content. Be sure to subscribe with notifications on and hit the like button. Number 8. Traction Control while several modern road cars now use traction control in order to make driving on the road safer, this feature is currently banned in F1 cars, despite being perfected by F1 drivers of decades past. For reference, traction control is basically an electronic monitoring system that detects wheel slippage and intervenes to stop the wheels from losing grip completely. This can save lives while on the road and be useful in track situations, and thus, after a lot of deliberation, it was banned by F1 in 1993 with the reason being that the rule makers wanted to make driving more challenging and lessen the advantage held by the most well-funded teams. While this was fine with most teams, a scandal soon erupted in 1994 when Benetton was accused of cheating the rules. More specifically, an analysis of the Benetton B194 race car's computers showed suspicious traction control software was on board. However, the team claimed that it was inactive, and because the investigators could not prove that they had actually used it, the matter was dropped. However, since Benetton driver Michael Schumacher went on to win the 1994 championship, the win is still contested by many to this day. Number 7. Exotic Fuels While F1 racers may guzzle a lot of gas, the engineers behind them are actually really big on fuel efficiency. That's because the more fuel a car has, the heavier it is, and thus engineers have a vested interest in making their fuel last for as long as possible, so less of it can be put in the tank. Thus, after new restrictions on both fuel capacity and refueling made the efficiency issue key, Honda and Shell teamed up to craft a fuel that was as efficient as possible. It was made almost entirely out of pure toluene, and the duo were so proud of their creation that it even published a technical paper on it. Yet since toluene is a known carcinogen, many people became concerned with it being used on the track, and so in 1993, organizers mandated that F1 fuel must be similar to regular gasoline, so as to stop this dangerous fuel from becoming mainstream. On our end, we think preventing carcinogens from going into the air was a good move on the part of F1's organizers. Number 6. McLaren's Brake Steer While most cars only have one brake, McLaren figured that two was better than one when building the 1997 MP412. That's because rather than just use one brake for all four wheels, it instead had a second brake pedal to control braking for the rear wheels. The thinking behind this was that the second brake could brake steer around corners, which would help both the car turn more easily and reduce the sensation that the driver was moving in a straight line on curves. Since McLaren found that their brake steer system cut both half a second per lap in initial testing and that the drivers liked it, they added it to their new F1 cars. However, they kept it a secret so as not to tip off the other teams. However, the secret was revealed once a photographer noticed that the MP412's brake discs were glowing mid-corner, which was not normal on a conventional car. This led to most of the other teams petitioning for this system to be made illegal, and in 1998 it was officially banned by F1. 
Yet given that McLaren ended up both winning that year's championships and adding brake steer to some of his regular road cars, we think it's fair to say that they weren't all that upset. Number five, the Project 34. While F1s are very different from most cars, one common similarity is that both have four wheels. However, in 1976, F1 engineer Derek Gardner decided to reinvent the wheel with a car known as the Project 34. You see, at the time, almost every car on the circuit used the same Cosworth DFV engine, the same Hewland gearbox, and the same Goodyear tires. And thus, by adding a couple new wheels, Gardner hoped to gain a slight advantage. According to his calculations, a car with four small front wheels contained within the width of the bodywork would outperform two large ones, as they would reduce the amount of lift generated by normal front wheels, which would in turn allow for less focus on the front end aerodynamics and produce a car with the equivalent of about 40 horsepower. This led to a lot of secretive planning between both the engineers and tire companies, and the secret was so well kept that reportedly even the drivers didn't know about the change until the day they were set to use them. Patrick de Pallier and Jody Schechter were the first two drivers to try out the six-wheel Project 34 car, and while Schechter in particular was not a fan, the car's fundamentals carried through as he ultimately achieved one win, five podiums, and a third-place finish in the World Championship while driving the Project 34. However, while driver Ronnie Peterson would go on to continue the trend of using a six-wheeled car in 1977, the entire design fell out of favor entirely by 1978. It turns out that while Goodyear spent a lot of time and money developing its conventional tires, the upgrades to the small 10-inch tires needed for Project 34 were almost non-existent, making the better designed back wheels increasingly unbalanced with the front ones. Thus, while the true potential of this design was never truly realized, after six-wheeled cars were banned in the early 80s, this innovation quickly died. Number four, ground effect. While ground effect has been floated as a solid idea for quite some time, it really began to take off only after the creation of the Lotus 78. You see, the idea of using the underside of a racing car to generate negative pressure and effectively suck the car towards the track had first been exploited in the Can-Am sports car series of the 1960s. But this was seen as incompatible with F1 cars, since the Can-Am cars were much wider in stature and were wheel-enclosing. However, in 1977, engineers were finally able to match this principle to an F1 car, with a creation known as the Lotus 78. This required many aerodynamic changes, and these included making the central tub unusually narrow, making the side pods take up a far larger proportion of the car's width, and adding nylon skirts to the side pods so as to create a seal between the underbody and the road, which was a crucial part in propagating negative pressure beneath the car. That negative pressure was created by the internal shaping of the side pods, which due to the angle of things such as the radiators and auxiliary fuel tanks, was able to create the internal Venturi shape that's crucial in exploiting the airflow and allowing the car to follow the Bernoulli principle, which states that an increase in speed occurs simultaneously with a decrease in static pressure. Science aside, engineer Colin Chapman first debuted the car in 1977, and after famed racer Mario Andretti took the wheel of the Lotus 78, it only took three races for him to win the car's first victory. These principles were then used to make the Lotus 79, which further went on to do well on the F1 circuit. And while the Lotus's focused on ground effect would eventually fall out of favor, it has been revived recently with the 2021 regulations emphasis on close racing it's likely we'll see some similar cars to begin to pop up in the future. Number three, active ride. Generally speaking, a car cannot achieve peak aerodynamic performance at all times. After all, there are certain points in the track where certain features will be more pronounced than others, meaning that your car will not always be in the perfect position. However, with active ride, this all changed because this feature used hydraulic pressure to lengthen or shorten actuators fitted to each wheel with the help of computer data, which ultimately allowed the car to achieve the most aerodynamic height at all times. This practically made it immune to conventional car pitches, dives, and rolls on its suspension, and its much narrower range of ride heights and rake angles also allowed the cars themselves to be designed more efficiently in other areas. Now, Active Ride was first used on the Lotus 92 back in 1983, but it wasn't until the 1992 FW14B that it really hit the mainstream after Williams put it into all of its F1 cars. 
the idea for it was taken, oddly enough, from ambulances, and due to all the accompanying electronic compartments working both predictively and reactively, cars made by Williams won 10 out of 16 races that year, as even the most basic of cars using the feature to clock in a 12% decrease in lift to drag ratio. However, since a lot of this tech took control away from the driver, active ride was banned in 1994, effectively killing it. Thus, the FW15C stands as the ultimate showcase for what F1 could have been. Number two, the double diffuser. Regulations sometimes suck, yet sometimes the best innovations come from people trying to get around them. Such was the case with the double diffuser, which only came into being thanks to an ingenious attempt to skirt around the rules. For context, for years, F1 had wrestled with the issue of dirty air coming out of aero appendages, and this was becoming a growing problem because the dirty air was preventing overtakes, which are exciting for viewers at home. Thus, in 2009, F1 decided to address this issue by ruling that manufacturers had to keep the step plane, which is the bit of the floor that the plank is attached to, and the reference plane, which is the actual floor, flat and uninterrupted, which would mean that no holes could exist to let up dirty air. This was coupled with the new rules about diffuser height, with the regulations stating that they could only be 175 millimeters high. However, Honda soon realized that regulations did not say anything about the transition from the step plane to the reference plane. Thus, by putting a hole here and using it to channel air up to a second diffuser, they could not only raise the diffuser height to about 300 millimeters, but also create a massive amount of downforce. Yet, since Honda decided to leave the F1 scene in 2008, the technology was passed down to Williams, Toyota, and famously, the Braun GP team. Created by a team of Honda employees that had been made redundant, Braun GP's car was an absolute monster, winning six out of its first seven races and eventually winning the world championship. As a result, a double diffuser was adopted by nearly every F1 team the following year, with Red Bull coming out on top with a car that is widely considered to have the most downforce of any F1 car ever. However, after 2010, F1 decided to ban double diffusers, thus slowing down cars and putting a cap on what could have been a cool piece of technology going forward. Number 1. The Brabham BT46 Fan Car Generally speaking, race cars rely on airflow pushing downwards to generate grip, creating a phenomenon known as downforce. In order to create this, you can either stick wings to the top of a car or create a low-pressure zone underneath it to suck the car onto the track. There are several technologies out there that are able to do this, yet none were quite as strange as the Brabham BT46B fan car. First built in 1978, it used a fan to suck air out from underneath the car through the engine bay. Brabham told the public that this was done in order to fix the car's serious overheating issues from the past, but in reality it had the double effect of generating a massive amount of downforce. As a result, after the fan was added, the car began to work wonders. More specifically, in its first race in this configuration, it blew spectators away by having so much downforce that even a massive oil spill on the track could do nothing to derail it. As a result, it easily won the race, and by extension, the 1978 Swedish Grand Prix at Anderstorp. This soon drew up a flurry of protest from the other teams, who argued that the fan created a massive competitive advantage and should be banned. After a lot of pressure, it was banned for all future races, but due to it technically not being illegal at the time of racing, Brabham was allowed to maintain its 1978 Swedish Grand Prix title. Thus, while simply adding a fan to a car on the surface may seem pretty benign, this car goes to show that it can really make a massive difference. Watch our Vehicles playlist for more Top 15 videos about amazing vehicles. Sit back, relax, and binge watch all of our best vehicle videos.